Amy Goyer, thank you so much for joining us to talk about a subject that's very, very important to ARP and our members, caregiving, family caregiving, um, making all of our lives as we age better and easier and healthier. So I, I want to thank you for, for coming on to talk to us today. And if I could ask you just up front, what is something that people don't know about caregiving or that people would be surprised to know about caregiving? Well, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, a great quote that you've probably heard from Rosalind Carter, uh, the former first lady, she always says people have either been a caregiver, you are a caregiver, or you will be a caregiver. And I always add, you'll be a care recipient. And pe many people think of caregiving as something that someone else does. It won't affect them. And I think the truth is that everyone comes into contact with caregiving in some way. It really is a truly universal issue. And, um, you know, whether the caregiving is across a wide range. You might be just checking in on someone. Uh, you might be providing some socialization for them and mental health support. You might be taking them to the grocery store or going to a doctor appointment with them. Uh, you might be doing yard work for them or helping with the finances. The financial management aspect of caregiving is something that people often just don't think about. And then you might also be more involved in personal care, um, helping with every uh, personal need, bathing, toileting, grooming, food, eating, preparing meals. Um, a lot of, of caregivers help with household expenses. They pay the rent or they pay for the utilities and that kind of thing. And, you know, um, so I think, you know, that's people think of them, don't think of themselves as caregivers. And that's, that's too bad because there are resources for caregivers out there and there's support. But if we don't think of ourselves as a caregiver, we're not going to access those things or even look for those resources. So that's the first thing is I like to make sure that people understand you are a caregiver if you're doing any of those things. Yeah, I've definitely experienced that from sort of the extreme of, in, in, in the case of my mom, someone who needed full-time care and we had hospice care and, 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 and all that. And then that was my dad. It was much less. It was more just helping him you know, with his finances and, and his household stuff, but, you know, not the intense personal care and and then in the case of my in-laws it's been the same same thing so so i can definitely attest to the fact that people become caregivers at various times in in their lives i was i was in my 30s in, in my mom's case so that was actually i was in my 20s so you know pretty young um but but outside of you know my own experience which feels like a lot but it's all all personal and 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 uh and personal to me, you have a long experience both as a professional and in your own own personal life. Could you tell us about that? Well, I um, I actually started out my career as a music therapist, and I worked in adult daycare centers and nursing homes for many years. And then I worked for the Ohio Department of Aging, and um, you know was involved in home and community based services and uh, a lot of intergenerational programs and initiatives. And then I went to work for AARP full time and again, worked on um, family programs, intergenerational programs, grandparent caregivers. And then um, now my biggest focus is on family caregivers. And, uh, you know, so that's my my professional trajectory. But my personal, like you, I was a caregiver when I was in my 20s. My my I grew up in Ohio. Um, I was born in Indiana, grew up in Ohio. My parents are both from Indiana. So my parents moved to Arizona. My dad was a college professor and he was teaching at Arizona State University. But my grandparents were all in Indiana. And uh, my dad was an only child. So my mom had a brother and a sister living in Indianapolis near my grandmother. And as she aged, my grandfather passed away fairly young. Um, but my, when my, as my grandmother aged, there was other family to help out. And I would go over, I would drive over. I lived in Columbus, Ohio then for 10 years after I graduated from college at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. And I would be the respite person for my grandmother. So I would give the other ones a break and take her to church and take her to the grocery store. She never drove a car. And um, that was a very different role than I had for my dad's parents. My dad was an only child and he, my grandmother had Alzheimer's 
and my grandfather was 10 years older than she and he was his her primary caregiver for many years and you know dad eventually started helping with the finances and managing as much as he could from the distance and i would drive over to their house in south bend indiana six and a half hours and um, make sure they were getting the care i got him signed up for meals on wheels my grandmother um, was dealing with incontinence and my grandfather had no idea how to deal with that. So I, you know, explained about, you know, adult briefs and pads and things that you could do and helped with that. And um, I can remember my, I, my grandfather, you know, it was a lot of socialization too, because, you know, they were becoming more isolated. We eventually got some help in the home and eventually they had 24 seven care at home. Um, and I would, you know, check in, make sure the caregivers were doing what they should be doing and all that. But I remember so well, my grandfather never wanted me to leave when it came time for me to go, you know, wow. and he would always think of something else he needed me to do. And one of the things I remember one day is he wanted me to thread some needles for him. <laughs> he would take a plastic garment bag and have all different colors thread th uh, of thread, you know, in the needle hanging down with long thing of thread so that by the time I came back, he, he would have used that up and then I'd rethread another long one. But was that right? Oh, wow. He was so clever. And so he did all the mending and everything. He was just amazing. Um, and, and my grandparents did um, run out of money eventually. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather was retired military. And at that time, the VA didn't have the kind of in-home supports that they have. Mm -hmm. And so they went into a nursing home for uh, my grandmother died in four weeks and my grandfather six weeks later. Oh, wow. And that was that was a really hard experience. So I vowed when it came to my parents that I would not that would not happen to them. Mm -hmm. And there are good nursing homes out there. I'm not bashing nursing homes, but the ones my grandparents had a choice of were not very high quality and mm -hmm. they didn't get the best of care. And even more important, we weren't right there to go every day and make sure they were getting and help with her, their care. So my flash forward. My mom had a stroke when she was just 63 um, oh, wow. while I was caring, while we were caring for my dad's parents and her mom and everything. So dad became her primary caregiver as well as his role with his parents. And my sisters and I, I have three sisters. Um, I had three older sisters and we would take turns, you know, helping out. I had just started a new job at the Ohio Department of Aging. And more than 60% of family caregivers are working while they're caring. But, you know, it's, it's like another part-time or full-time job when you're caregiving. Lots of challenges. And leave is one of the problems, have being able to take leave. Well, I had just started this job. But they had a program where people could donate their leave that they weren't using and didn't think they would use. So I was able to borrow leave go out to Arizona for two weeks, get my mom into a good rehab program, you know, um, deal with the hospital and those sorts of things. And then my sister came and took over and we, you know, took turns. So that was um, in 1989 when mom had her stroke. Many years of caregiving over the years with, with you know, she was not paralyzed, but she had chronic pain on her right side. And there was always some new therapy or some new thing. And it was also giving my dad a break because she could no, no, no longer drive. Uh, she couldn't cook meals really independently because of, of the cognitive impairment. Um, and she could be alone for periods of time. And my dad continued to work, but then he became an AARP volunteer. I bet you can't imagine how that happened. <laughs> My mom would go with him, you know, and that sort of thing. But uh, my dad had a hip replacement. So then I, I came out and I telecommuted for a month and helped out while he recovered. So there were things like that. But in around 2006, 2007, my dad started having more issues. And we started to be concerned that he might have dementia himself. And in 2009, um, everything came to a head. The doctor says, you know, he's got Alzheimer's. My mom um, was having more and more health problems. So I turned my life upside down. I'm sorry, I'm just rattling on and on here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's okay. This is, this is a very interesting story. But I think a lot of what you mentioned, a lot of our audience has experienced, you know. Right. And that's, you know, that's why, yeah, that's why I try to share because 
I have had a real variety of caregiving experiences from mm -hmm. being the respite caregiver to being the completely full on hands on primary caregiver. And that's what I ended up doing for my parents. So mm -hmm. I ended up coming out to Arizona. My parents moved into a senior community for three years because my dad didn't want them to be independent when we wanted him to stop driving. They, they didn't want them to be isolated yeah. um, when he stopped driving. So I moved into their house and they moved into a senior community for three years. During that time, both of their health declined, numerous hospitalizations. Mom fractured her spine, had, spine, had to learn to walk again. My dad's dementia got worse. Um, and then when they needed 24-7 care, I moved them back in the house with me. Um, and in, you know, in the meantime, my business needs needed, meant I needed to be in Washington, D.C., very regularly and you know the cost of everything in washington dc well i had a place i'd rented for years so my rent was fairly low less than staying in a hotel when i went every month so i kept that place so now i have had two places my parents had a property in ohio and a farm and they were you know so i was dealing with at one point my parents apartment the farm in ohio their house that i was living in my rental place in the DC area, it was just overwhelming. So um, eventually my, uh, my dad, you know, when they moved back in the house and they needed 24 hour care, it was just like the money was just not there. And I played for veterans benefits for my dad, aid and attendance benefits. And aid and, you know, dad was a World War II and Korean War veteran. Um, the VA had some wonderful supports for us. It is an arduous process, but I recommend that you stick with it. You get some help. We had help from my parents' uh, estate planning attorney. Um, he was um, extremely helpful and would walk things over to turn them in, the paperwork, and explain to me how to organize it all. Did not charge for that process because um, they had done their estate planning with them. And uh, But the financial part of it got harder and harder. And um, my mom passed away a year after they moved in with me. I had hired a live-in caregiver. And then when I was out of town for work, my um, sister, I'd fly my sister in from Ohio to take my place. And uh, then my dad was with me for six years um, with dementia. Increasingly, increasingly, he died at the age of 94, just about three years ago. And um, it was so much longer and so much more intense. I, I, believe my parents had the best possible care I could give them. Um, but, you know, when someone has Alzheimer's, it's a long haul and the expenses add up. Um, it, it is uh, hard for people to understand and imagine how much it costs to have a caregiver with a person 24 seven for that long. And, um, and I kept struggling to try and keep up. Um, I made the mistake of not reaching out for help with the financial aspects. Mm -hmm. I kept thinking I should be able to handle it. And you know, Bruce, that's just not, I'm not a financial expert. I'm a caregiving expert. Yeah. You know, I know how to, how to take care of people. I knew how to get my parents, maximize their income, get them any benefits they were eligible for. They were not eligible for Medicaid. Um, but uh, so I ended up putting things on credit cards, trying to transfer them to zero balance, trying to keep up with it. Then I couldn't pay anything but the minimum because I was trying to keep up with the monthly expenses as they went up. And um, when my dad passed away, I was just in a, in a world of pain. And I met with lawyers and financial advisors and every single one of them um, it said, you just need to, to, to go declare bankruptcy. So I had to file for bankruptcy and it's been a really difficult process. And I kind of hate that that intense caregiving journey ended that way. And I was also caring for my sister at the same time, my oldest sister who lived in Maryland and I was her power of attorney and she had Cushing disease. She died the year after my mom and I was responsible for emptying her house out. And it was kind of borderline on the hoarding side and lots of stuff. So lots of expense in that. And then her house sold for less than it uh, was owed. So I didn't get oh. any Wow. So all this to say, I've had a wide variety of caregiving experiences and I have made mistakes. I have learned a lot. Nobody is a perfect caregiver, 
Um, but I did my best and that's what I can, I have no regrets in that sense. I, that's what I keep trying to hold on to. You know, the financial aspects were surprising, even to me, even with all my experience and my professional experience and everything, I, it, it just got to be so hard. And, um, and so I really urge people, get some financial advisors for yourself, the caregivers. Yeah, well, that is, that, that is quite a story. And, you know, I sort of share that idea that I think I did the best I could for my parents, it's, it's especially for my dad. Um, but, you know, you always feel like, well, there's something more, you know, yeah. I could have done. But, you know, I, you, know, <laughs> you know, I think for me and I, I, I tell my wife, too, you know, we certainly tried. You know, like it's kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of like raising children. You kind of have to do the best you can and to hope that that's, that's enough. And if, I think if your heart's in the right place, you know, ho hopefully it all, all, it all works out. Yes. Um, but, you know, it is, it is so important to try and get help. And, you know, in my mom's case, we had home hospice and, you know, that was just a godsend. And I'd never really heard of that before. And, oh, you know, really? there, there, there were people, people at the hospital who kind of connected us with, with, with that. And, you know, it was my dad and I doing the caregiving, but that was just so key. And 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 that was a service, as I say, I knew nothing about, didn't didn't know what they did, right. and and now I'm just an evangelist for it. You know, and I'm not I'm not sure if that that program exists in the same way. I, I'm sure it does, and I hope well, it does. Yeah, but. absolutely. And my my dad was on hospice care for four months that the, of the VA arranged for him. Medicare pays for hospice care. And it tends to be, uh, it's just a little bit more help and support. Mm -hmm. That's the cool thing about hospice is um, we had, we did, we, at that point we had the VA coming in every day. The VA prayed for an aide to come in and help us get daddy out of bed and get him bathed and everything. Mm -hmm. But as ho when hospice came in, they took over three days a week of that. Yeah. And, and you know that the other thing about hospice is they have social workers who help you, the the loved ones. They have um, um, a chaplain. They have, and they do have, you know, nurses on call like twenty four seven. And that's so valuable to be able to call somebody and say, "This is what's happening. I'm not sure what this means." Yeah. Well, you know, I definitely like to ask you, you know, about all the resources that ARP has, and also how people can can find help in their own communities. But yeah. I want to. Uh, I want to ask you first, we, we, we were talking a little bit earlier about some recent work that you've been doing um, on fraud and and how that relates to caregiving and also just, just our older parents. Um, and as, as as listeners and viewers know, we do a lot of fraud work. So that's that's right up our, our alley. But um, could you tell us about the work that you've been doing um, around fraud and the caregiving realm. Right. Well, you know, uh, care scams and fraud are a big part of the caregiver role because what we do is we end up trying to educate our loved ones and prevent scams and fraud and we see it coming, you know, and we, we're doing the best we can. Lots of caregivers ask me, how can I prevent my mom from getting all this mail and sending money out and that sort of thing. We did a survey just recently, an AARP survey that found one in five caregivers uh, have a loved one who's lost money to a scam. And more than half of those have lost more than $1,000. Well, $1,000 is a lot of money when you're on uh, a fixed income. When oh, I got yeah. involved, you know, I mean, that's, that's and, and it's late in their lives, Bruce, so they don't have time to recover as much. You can't rebuild as well. Mm -hmm. And that's really tough. Um, when I got involved with my parents and started helping my dad with his finances. It was one of the first things dad needed help with was the finances, the complicated things, you know, but what I found out was he had been sending money to a gentleman who would call him. Uh, and this went on for years, apparently. Um, and he would call and say he was a disabled veteran and he wanted, you know, to know would dad help and support him. He was quote selling Ziploc bags and light bulbs. So my dad would send him money, way more money than the value of these items that he would send. And he would send some items, but they were really poor quality, like oh, really yeah. poor quality. So he was somehow, you know, bilking this money out of people. And especially my dad was a veteran. So he, he thought of this guy as a friend and he was helping him out. And 
you know, and it, it was a scam. And I, I he's, he even had an organization. I looked it up. It didn't exist. Um, and of course, he blocked his phone number. So I couldn't see the phone number on the caller ID. So, um, you know, I that was horrible for me. I, I finally, when my parents moved to the senior community, we changed their phone number. And that's how we finally got rid of him. I would ask him not to call, tell him dad had Alzheimer's. He couldn't afford this, et cetera. He, he kept calling. He'd try and get dad on the phone. So it was just really a nightmare. And this is what many family caregivers go through. Uh, you know, they target older adults. And, uh, you know, when, when we have loved ones who are vulnerable like that, it's just so frustrating and, uh, you know, it's, it's outrageous. Yeah, it's, I've, I've, I've seen a lot of examples. And, you know, you know, also, as you'd say, someone who's on a fixed income and they're losing forty dollars to a charity scam or or, or like a hundred dollars you know that's that's hard enough but when someone loses their life savings to a con artist then there really is no way to make that up you know if somebody has a mass um savings and a and a and a nest egg so to speak yeah. and right. then that and and also in terms of their care you've sort of counted on this nest egg and they've counted on it and suddenly it's gone that those are some of the most tragic um, frauds that I've seen. So, yeah, yeah. and, and, you know, it's so hard because a lot of times people who are, who are con artists and are criminals craft their scams to appeal, you know, to someone, you know, who, who, who does have a strong affinity for, for, for being, being in the military or being a member of their church or, being a fan of a sports team and, you know, and, and people are supporting are, the police. Yeah. Are supporting yeah. the police. Yeah. So all these frauds and, you know, I have a, I have a father who was a, who was a very savvy guy, but he, he, he fell for an IRS scam where they called and told him that the sheriffs were on their way to his door. If, if he didn't pay his back taxes within the next half hour, he would be arrested. And, you know, even though I talked to him about frauds quite a bit, he, you know, he fell for that. And, yeah. you know, we fortunately were able to, we fortunately were able to stop it by going to his bank, but you know, it's, you know, it just shows you that, boy, it can just happen so fast. Um, is, is there any advice that, that you can give to, to, to people on, on how to protect their loved ones from, from these sort of crimes? Right. Well, first of all, focus on prevention. Like I said, you, you mentioned you talk to your father-in-law about scams and fraud a lot. That's actually the best thing you can do is to talk with them. Um, we found in our survey that 85% of family caregivers do talk with their loved ones about fraud and scams. Everyone should be doing that. Talk about the types of scams. You know, we have the most common scams that we're seeing right now are imposter scams. They pretend, like you said, to be the IRS or Social Security or Medicare, or they pretend that they're from the utility company and there's they have delinquent bills um, and they're going to lose their service if they don't pay right away. And then the grandparent scam is the one that you hear about a lot, where they pretend to be a grandchild um, or maybe another family member. Usually we hear about grandchildren and they need cash fast and don't tell mom and dad. And, you know, I, I just heard of a, a gentleman the other day who, who lost seven thousand dollars to a grandparent scam. So, you know, talk with them. You know, as caregivers, we need to stay educated ourselves on what these scams are. And the ARP Fraud Watch Network has um, alerts and, and notifications, and they, they'll send you out things about the latest scams. Read them. Tell your loved ones about them. Um, you know, I think, Bruce, it's so important that you talk with them, but in, it doesn't have to be confrontational. Mom, you you think you might do this, da, da, da. That, that approach is not going to help. But what you can approach it is we're all in this together. My sister just got scammed recently, a computer scam. Mm -hmm. Um, it can happen to anyone. So let's talk about this. Um, did you hear about the latest Medicare scam? You know, um, I, I, here's what I would do if that happened to me. What would you do? You know, and talk talk through that. In fact, role playing is really one of the greatest things you can do. You know, pretend you're someone dialing up, you know, uh, oh, I need your social security number. Or I need your banking account number. And write up a refusal script for your loved ones. Keep it by the phone. Um, you can give them a nice polite because older people tend to be more polite and on the phone and that sort of thing. Okay. You can be polite, but you can be assertive and say, don't give your business. Uh, I don't give any business uh, information over the phone. I don't give personal information or financial information. 
Um, if you have something you want from me or you want me to donate, mail me something. That, you know, over and over. And my, you know, my, my, someone in my family just recently got scammed uh, and they said they were supporting the police, mm -hmm. even though we've talked about it and talked about it uh, with her. Uh, you know, she still thought, well, the police, you know, so she gave them her credit card number. But she, as soon as she was done, she thought, I don't know if I should have done that. She called us. We were able to get it reversed at the bank. But, you know, just going over it, the more you repeat that, you know, the more helpful it can be. Yeah, I think that's so important. Um, one of the things that I've heard a lot of is that older people who, who are approached by a scam or have been scammed, they don't want their kids to know because they don't want to lose their independence. They don't want their children or relatives to think they can't manage their affairs. And so they don't tell anyone. And so I think, you know, if, if you can just reassure your, your older loved ones that these scammers are good, they target a lot of people, a lot of people can be taken in. Um, and if you tell us about what's going on, we aren't going to hold it against you somehow. Right, um, yeah. You know, yeah. That's, that's just important because so many people hide the fact that they're being scammed and, until all their money's gone. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's important to be sensitive about that and be respectful. Yeah. Again, I feel like this approach, we're all in this together, not your vulnerable mom. Yeah. You need to do something. I'm vulnerable too. We all are yeah. vulnerable scams. So it, to approach it that way, it's a, it makes them feel more comfortable. So they will tell you if something happened. And the more frequently you're talking about scams and sharing stories, you can approach it in that kind of an indirect way. Oh, how about this story I just read? Or here's this. Here's what happened to my friend. Keep that as a topic of conversation. So if it does happen, they're more comfortable calling and saying, you know, this happened. I'm feeling kind of strange about it. And as we did with our family member, we were just like, it's okay. You know, we understand. Can happen to anybody. Mm -hmm. Let's let's. Here's what we're gonna do. And um, and we made sure all of the contacts in her phone were up to date, so uh -huh. that we said if you don't recognize the name on your phone do not answer it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's especially, you know, a lot of people have mobile phones now, but even sometimes your home phones, you can, you know, look for the name on the caller ID. And, um, and, and the other thing is to get the notifications from the bank, you know, and, and the other company, the utilities, all of anybody who you can get access to sending the notifications. There's an unusually large amount taken out or transferring funds a lot, things like that. Yeah, you know, actually, I, I I hadn't really thought of that in in, in terms of older people. But I get text notices from my bank and my credit card. So yeah, you could certainly use that as a oh, effective strategy to keep. Yeah, I had all of my parents' accounts so that I would get notified notified if there was anything late or or anything was um, even if things. Sometimes you can get notified because sometimes people will pay things twice. Mm -hmm. and you don't want that to happen, but I think what's most helpful is if, if a certain amount is taken out or you get a low balance, things like that, that can be a, a quick alert that something unusual has happened. Well, that's that's mm -hmm. excellent advice. Actually, that leads me to my next question, which is what can we do to prepare to be caregivers? Um, you know, if, if we're of the age where, you know, our parents are, are looking at that you know, perhaps in the near or far future, but is, is there any advice that you can give to help us get ready to be caregivers? Yes, you know, it, it, caregiving often kind of comes out of nowhere for many of us. Someone has a sudden health uh, crisis, like a stroke or a heart attack, some sudden change. But for most of us, it's it's just something that comes on slowly and you gradually increase support over the years for loved ones as they age. So I say to caregivers, even if whether it's a, it comes on all of a sudden or if it's something that's a gradual increasing of support, it's helpful to be prepared. And yes, you cannot predict a, a person's health exactly how it's going to unfold or how a disease is going to progress and when anything's going to happen. But there's certain things that you can be prepared for. Um, the first thing is to deal with the legal issues and make sure, does your loved one have powers of attorney set up for finances and for health care? Do they have all of their advanced directives in place? Um, do you know what their wishes are? 
Do they want to have a do not resuscitate order? Um, do they, you know, what, 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 how do they want the end of their life to be? Talk, talk about these things way ahead. And I always tell caregivers, it is so much easier to talk about these difficult topics when they're something hypothetical, there's something off in the distance, not when you're in the middle of a crisis or something is imminent. So try to have these conversations early and often and talk about the finances, talk about how they want to live, talk about what kind of care they want to receive, where they want to live. Um, talk about, you know, it, it, are there things that they want to be doing in the end of their life? Uh, you know, find out um, if they have the legal things in place and if not, help them get those things in place. The other thing is to look at the finances. Um, I told you a little bit about our story and my parents did plan. Um, they just could never have predicted the length of diseases and the amount of money and, and costs go up constantly, you know, and you know, so do the best you can to plan financially and working with a financial planner or financial advisor can be extremely helpful. Uh, if you're a caregiver and you're worried about your parents and you don't know what planning they've done, you know, um, have conversations with them. See, see if you can help, you know, find out again, make sure that they understand your interest is just in supporting them and being able to do a good job and to follow their wishes if and when the time comes. As caregivers, we also need to prepare. And I think this is the harder part, again, because we don't know when it's going to hit. We have our own lives going on. We have things that we need to do. But you can look at things like if you're working and uh, you know that sometime in the future, you're probably going to be needing to do some caregiving. Find out what the leave options are with your employer. Find out what caregiver supports they have. Um, understand Family and Medical Leave Act leave. Find out if there's paid leave in your state or in your organization. So investigate all of those kinds of supports. And if you can, try to plan fin financially for yourself too. Uh, if you plan to make a change in your work situation, that will affect your finances. Uh, if you um, want to be, or think you're going to need to help pay for care, that will affect your finances. So as a caregiver, meet with your own financial advisors to help prepare you for a time when you might be caregiving. Yeah, 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 that is that is so important. And as you say, no one knows when that need is going to is going to come upon you. Exactly. Um, are, are there are, are there resources that ARP has that people can take advantage of that, that you could point us to? Absolutely. ARP has a plethora of really, really helpful. We try to make things really practical and helpful. Um, I wrote a book called Juggling Life, Work and Caregiving for AARP, and it's a guide. It goes over the health, the financial taking care of yourself, the caregiver, you know, caring for people at home, caring pe for people living in a facility. And I even go over end of life and life after caregiving. Um, again, I'm a caregiver. I, I understand you don't have time for a lot. So I tried to make it easy for you to go to the information you need when you need it. And that's that's the goal. ARP wants caregivers to have what they need when they need it. So ARP has created an incredible caregiving website at aarp.org slash caregiving. And there we have articles and tips and tools. We have a long-term care cost calculator. We have um, some wonderful free resources. We have uh, AARP family caregiving guides and, um, and we have them in English and Spanish and Chinese. We have an LGBTQ version. We have a military and veteran version. We've tried to kind of address the different viewpoints and the, and the, the, the issues that people um, are dealing with as caregivers. We also have state caregiver resource guides for every state. And uh, you can find those at aarp.org slash caregiver resource guides. And uh, we also have a financial workbook for family caregivers. And it is an incredibly helpful resource. You can find that at aarp.org slash caregiver money. And um, we have, again, a Spanish version, a Chinese version, and a military and veterans version. We have some great resources, Bruce, you probably know for veterans at AARP. And, and you can just go to aarp.org slash veterans. 
and you'll find all kinds of resources for family caregivers caring for veterans and military service members, and also um, all kinds of issues that veterans uh, go through. We have a lot of support for them. Yeah, actually, I just heard of a new uh, a new product that we have that's a, a veterans health benefits navigator. Right. Um, and that's at ARP.org slash vets health navigator. Yes. Um, and I've seen that and and, and and that seems like a great tool too. And it that's is. brand new. That was in the last month or so. Yeah, in the last few months. And and it, it is it's especially helpful because the VA can be really confusing. <laughs> yeah. Like I've I heard said, that. You know, it's it was an arduous process for me to get my dad um, go through the, the aid and attendance benefits uh, process. Mm -hmm. It took a year and but it was retroactive from the time of application. So it's worth getting a ball rolling and getting some help. But the uh, the veteran health benefits navigator that we offer from ARP it helps you go through everything from choosing, you know, tri care and you know, what are the health benefits? It took, you know, it was confusing for me to get my dad enrolled in VA healthcare because he had never done that in the past. He had gone on, he, he, when he left the service, he gone on, he was a professor, he had his insurance and everything. But the VA had some incredible supports for him as well as caregiver supports. So check out the, the uh, caregiver um, support program at the VA as well. Okay, and you know, I would also mention our fraud watch um, resources, which are at arp.org slash fraud watch network. Um, and, and I will list the links to all these so right. you don't have to try and write them down. Um, we'll, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll have those listed in, in the, in the show notes. And, um, and, and Amy, you also have a book called juggling what life work and caregiving. Correct. Um, and that's available on Amazon and, and bookstores. So that is uh, that is a book that's worth worth checking out for for some tips um, as well. And is, is there anything that you can tell us about how what people can find help in their local communities? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that ARP has worked on with the Alzheimer's Association is called the Community Resource Finder, and you just go to communityresourcefinder.org. It is not exclusively for Alzheimer's support. There is a section of the tool that focuses on Alzheimer's support. But there's community-based services and medical services. And you can put in your zip code and do a local search. So, for example, I was just helping uh, someone looking for adult day services centers. And I say, you just go in and you care at home and community services. And then you click on adult daycare and it gave a, a list of 25 resources. I tried, you know, did it for my area. So that can be a huge help. It's also helpful to contact your local area agency on aging. They tend to know what's in the area and you can find your local area, area agency on aging by going to the elder care locator at eldercare.acl.gov and you put in your zip code. Or you can contact the state, your State Department of Aging will also have a listing probably or there'll be an association for the area agencies on aging in your state. So you can find them that way as well. Is, is there anything that we as a larger society can do to help caregivers? I mean, be, be beyond just trying, trying to take care of our own personal and family situations. Is, is, is there anything that you think we, we as a state of Washington should be doing to make life better for, for, for both people who are doing caregiving and the people that they are caring for? Well, you know, caregivers need support. It's extremely isolating being a caregiver because your life just gets more narrow. You know, focus on taking care of your loved ones. Maybe you're working and that's about all you can handle. So reaching out and offering support, but being specific is really helpful. I'm going to bring you a meal every Tuesday evening. That's fantastic. But if you say to someone, just let me know if you need any help. Most caregivers are never going to have the time to think about what they want and give you, you know, all of that. Um, maybe you're running to the grocery store and you can say to a caregiver, is there anything I can pick up for you? What's on your grocery list? Uh, maybe offer to do some yard work for them. Uh, you know, take them out to dinner, send them a, a gift card for a massage. Anything that you can do to kind of help them know they're not alone, know that you you see what they're doing. 
we feel invisible sometimes that you see what they're doing and that it's important and that you appreciate it. Tell them thank you. Thank you for what you're doing for your mom or dad. You know, that is, it goes a long way, Bruce. It's, it's really, really important. And if you see somebody who's struggling and you've heard, watched this interview, let them know about some of these resources we've been talking about. Many caregivers just don't know there's anything out there. They don't think anybody else is doing what they're doing, you know? The other thing that we can do as, as, uh, as supporters of caregivers is to find out if there's anything, um, any bills in the legislature that can be supported. Um, nationally, the Credit for Caring Act is, is up and we're, we're, we're telling people, let, let your members of Congress know. Caregiving is important. The Credit for Caring Act would give a, a, up to a $5,000 new non-refundable tax credit for family caregivers who are working. That would have made a huge difference for me, Bruce. It really would have. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not currently in that intensive caregiving situation right now, but, but I'm sure have let my members of Congress know it's important to me that that is passed because that could be me again. And it, it's, it's many people who I do care about. So, you know, stand up and, and say how important caregivers are. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, caregiving is something we shouldn't have to do by ourselves or or just in our own our own families. I mean, we definitely need support for family caregivers because they are the backbone of our of our care system. They absolutely you know? are. So, yeah. How can people learn more about you and your work? Well, you can follow me on um, Facebook. I have a Facebook page, at just facebook.com slash Amy Goyer. Um, you can follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn and, you know, all those social media platforms. Uh, you can see my columns on the AARP website at aarp.org slash Amy Goyer. And I want to urge everyone um, to talk, to come, if you are on Facebook or if you need to connect with other caregivers, I moderate AARP's Family Caregivers Discussion Group on Facebook. And I, I didn't mention this earlier as one of our resources, but we have over 8,500 members oh. in this Facebook group. It has, it's only about two years old. It's it, it almost, yeah, about two and a half years old. It's grown really quickly because it is meeting a specific need for people. And you can go on there anytime, 24 seven. It's a private group. Um, so you ask to join and my one of my colleagues and I, it, approve every single person who wants to join the group. We try to keep scammers out because a lot of scammers want to get in there and get caregivers because they see them as being vulnerable. And we share information, uh, caregivers vet and talk about how hard it is. And that's okay. You can do that. Um, and they share their triumphs and we do a lot of problem solving. You know, here's a problem I'm having with mom. What do I do about it? Well, and you know, 50 people will say, well, here's how it worked for me. Here's what I did that helped. I'm in there every day. I share a lot of resources and supports. So um, um, come, come find me in the ARP Family Caregivers Discussion Group. Okay, that's a, that sounds good. I'll, I'll, I'll check that out myself. And in terms of people getting started with ARP and caregiving, would you, would you say there's one place to start? Absolutely, the website. Go to aarp.org slash caregiving. And yeah. you'll, you'll even find links to our, our Facebook group there. You'll find links to the publications there that I've discussed today. So go to aarp.org slash caregiving. All right. Well, Amy, thank you very much for all your time today and all your expertise. This is such an important subject, but most of us don't know what we need to know until we need it or maybe even after we need it. So it's, it's so great that you are providing this information to our members because, as you say, we're probably all going to need it at some point. So, Absolutely. So I just want to say thank you again. And uh, I, I, I think we'll have to have you back because I was writing down questions as, as, as we went, but we don't have hours and hours to talk, but this is such a huge, a huge subject. So I hope you'll come back and, and help us out here in Washington State again. Absolutely. I'd love to. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you.